Oh, he is risen. What an incredible song. So glad that you're here today. If you're joining us online, welcome as we celebrate Easter together. It's uh, a terrific day to come together and recognize what happened almost 2,000, a little over 2,000 years ago. You know, 33 AD, Jesus was crucified, and then he rose from the dead. And what's amazing is it went from just, he just had 12 disciples, and then, he, you know, he started out with 12 disciples, then he had about 120 followers, it says, right around the time that he died, and then next thing you know, it explodes and transforms the whole world. I mean, today, there's 2.3 billion people that say that they're Christians. I mean, that's, just to give you perspective, that's one out of three people in the world. It's the biggest organization anywhere on the planet. If you were to take all the Christians, that 2.3 billion, that's bigger than China. That's bigger than China and Europe put together. That's bigger than China, Europe, and the United States. I mean, it's a it's, it's changed the fabric of society. We actually, whenever you have a birthday, you're marking your birthday to that event. It split history in two, before Christ and after Christ. It was a monumental thing, and that's why we celebrate Easter. That's one of the reasons we're talking about the resurrection, the power of it, how it changed everything. Now, what transformed that small group of 12 guys and then 120 and then they they you know they went from just a small group pretty much afraid defeated discouraged to courageous sharing their faith talking about what had happened and it really happened just in a moment in a moment why would that happen well in a word the resurrection the resurrection made all the difference now let me just say that's different than a resuscitation. Resuscitation is if you faint, somebody revives you, you're in a coma, you come out of it. Sometimes people, you know, they'll report like their heart stops for, you know, 10 minutes or 15 minutes and they're pronounced dead and somehow they're revived, right? And then they write a book about how they went to heaven. And listen, you can throw those books away. Those are resuscitations. What a resurrection happen is, is when somebody is, they're crucified, a spear is launched, launched into their heart, they're buried for three days, and then, they're, and then you see them around, that's serious. That's a resurrection. That changes everything. And that's what transformed the disciples and the followers. Like I said, they were afraid for their lives. Hey, we might be you know, caught up in that. Maybe we're next to be crucified. Next thing you know, just a day later, they're like, come on, Nero. You know, I'll take you on. I mean, it changed everything. You see, when we understand who we are in Christ, when we understand what God did for us, we have more hope than other people. We have, because we're living for a greater purpose. We're living for something greater that's happened in our lives. In fact, that's what I want to look at. It's really a good summary of Easter. What's Easter about? Well, it's about having more hope, more hope than you've had before, and certainly more hope than the world will give. Here's the reasons, four things. Number one is because we've been forgiven. See, why Jesus went to the cross is so that we could receive forgiveness. Jesus said, I'm going to die. I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to die for your sins. And then three days later, I'll rise from the dead. And that will prove what I said is really true. And they go together. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, how do we really know he died for our sins? I mean, there's no, that's, that's just his words. We don't know if that's true. When he rose from the dead, that proved it. He said that you can be sure that your sins are forgiven. He says, in Christ, we are set free by the blood of his death. And so we have, what, forgiveness of sins. That's what we're set free from, all that stuff we've done, stuff we're not proud of, stuff we wish we didn't do, things that kind of hold us back. You know, guilt has a way of weighing you down. It, it saps your energy. It, it, it starts to uh, just drag on us. It causes insomnia, negatively affects our, our relationships, 
A lot of times we're not even aware of all of the side effects that guilt has on our lives. But God says, you don't have to live with that. That's not my plan for you. I mean, we're, we all have stuff that we've got, you know, imperf- none of us are perfect, right? God says, I've covered it all, right? You don't have to have that guilt in your life. You know, have you ever really thought, who killed Jesus? I mean, who's to blame? Jesus said, you know, I'm going to the cross. But, I mean, how did he get there? Who, who would you blame for that? Well, it's not Judas. I know he betrayed him. But it's not, it's not Caiaphas. He's the high priest. He was kind of the ringleader. It's not, it's not Pilate. He was the governor. It wasn't the Sanhedrin or the governor of the Jews. It wasn't the Romans. It wasn't even the crowd. This might surprise you. But do you know who killed Jesus? God did. It was God. It was his idea. You know, the, uh, Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, it'll be showing today. And uh, when that came out a few years ago, people were saying, oh, I'm not going to see that. It's too gory. There's too much violence. You know, it's, well, it was violent for sure. But whose idea was that? It was God's. It, it was God's idea that Jesus would go to the cross. Look at what it says here. It says, all of us have strayed away like sheep. We've left God's paths to follow our own. He's saying we all did our own things. We sinned, and yet the Lord laid on him, talking about Jesus, the guilt and sins of us all. He says, from prison and trial, they led him away to his death. But who among the people realized that he was dying for their sins? Even the disciples at the time didn't even understand it. It, it like caught them off guard and suffering their punishment. He had done no wrong and he had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. And then he was put in a rich man's grave. That's, they're talking about Joseph of Arimathea. He donated his freshly hewn grave for Jesus' body to be put in. But it was, notice what it says. It's God's plan. It was God's plan all along that Jesus would go to the cross that he should suffer. Yet, and notice the tense change. It goes from past now into the future. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have a multitude of children. Why does the tense change from the past to the future? Because this was written by a prophet, Isaiah, 700 years before this whole thing happened, before Jesus died on the cross. 700 years before. He's saying this is what's going to happen. And because of it, there's going to be a lot of followers. There's going to be a, lo- a multitude. He's talking about the 2.3 billion all over the world that are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus today. It's happening all over the world. It's a powerful thing what happened. So certainly God was the architect behind this. It was his plan all along, but it's actually there's another party involved and in who's to blame for Jesus Jesus' death, who killed Jesus? This might surprise you. It's also us. We did. You see, he wouldn't have had to come if we hadn't sinned. Because of the way we've lived, when we've lived contrary to God's, God's ways, Jesus had to come and die for us as well. Jesus was handed over to die because, because of us, because of our sins. And he was raised from the dead to make us right with God. You know, if, if I were to come up with a definition of what is Easter, you know, you might have invited people to Easter service today. They might have asked you, well, what, what is Easter anyways? Here's to me in one line the definition of Easter, that Jesus was raised from the dead to make us right with God. <clears throat> That's the whole message. That's why he was raised from the dead. And so we can be completely forgiven. We don't have to have that stuff hanging over us, we can know, no, I'm right with God, which leads to the second thing. We're no longer afraid to die. You know, there's a lot of people that are afraid. To, in fact, honestly, the fear of death is really a universal fear, right? I mean, it's all over the world. It's a universal fear because it's the fear of the unknown. We don't know what's beyond our, you know, what happens when I die. And so there's, there's, a, there's a fear about it. And certainly the pandemic with COVID has raised that and elevated that in a lot of people's lives. People that already had a fear, but they kind of kept it in check. They're, you know, it's gone like ballistic, their fear of death. And 
there is a fear of death because it's like, well, what's going on afterwards? We wouldn't even know there is eternity, there's life after death, unless it was for Jesus. We might hope, we might wish, I, we would wonder, I wonder if there's something beyond. But we know for certain that there's life after death and a great life after death because of what Jesus did on the cross. It says, Jesus promised, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though they would die like everyone else. In other words, we're all going to die. Just There is this commonality, but he goes, what's different is when you put your faith in Christ, he goes, you'll live again. There is something to look forward to after death. Now, we know the Bible calls that heaven. Heaven's an awesome place. Now, if you watch TV and you see movies about heaven, you wouldn't think so. I mean, whenever I see heaven described, it looks pretty darn boring to me. I mean, you know, it's like, first thing, there's clouds, you know, like there's nothing to do except wander through the clouds that go about, you know, knee high and stuff. And then some people have harps, they're playing those. I don't even like harps. i thinking, well, is there a place for me? I mean, where's the electric guitar or something? Well, I mean, what's going down, you know, or the keyboard, you know, but they're playing harps, right? And they have wings and there's nothing to do and... What's up with that? If you read Revelation, John, who is one of the disciples, he actually had a vision of what heaven's like. He describes it in the book, last book of the Bible, Revelation. It is nothing like clouds and harps, let me just tell you. It's like, it's like, it's a major party. It's like going down for eternity. It's something you're going to look forward to. It's something that is going to be awesome. I mean, think of amazing how great the earth is and the beauty of the earth and I mean, God can outdo, he can do some amazing things. Not just, you know, everything's clouds. I don't get that. But he says, whoever believes in me, you'll live again. Now, the story of Easter is that Jesus, when he died, when he was crucified, they took him down. They put him in a tomb. People were buried in tombs back then, in like caves. You know, like mausoleums, basically. They didn't, they didn't bury him as much. They would put him in caves, and they would often have a family cave where they would keep throwing relatives in. After a while, there'd be a lot of bones in there. This was a new cave. They, put, they would put a rock over it, or like a big roll of big stone in front of the, the opening to the cave. And in this case, because of all the people that are involved, uh, the, the governor, Pilate, he had a seal put over the, they rolled a big stone, put a seal, put some guards there. The disciples were hiding. They were afraid. They were despondent. They were discouraged. They were filled with despair, hiding, afraid. And so one of the disciples, Mary Magdalene, she decides on the third day to go check out what's going down at the tomb. So she goes there. She notices the seal's broken. The guards are gone. Tomb, the, the rock in front of the tomb that is rolled away. She goes inside. She sees no body, but she sees Jesus' clothes that were wrapped, that shroud around. It's, it's off, and it's nicely folded at the steps. Now listen, some people say Jesus is, somebody stole Jesus' body. If you're going to steal a body, you might as well leave the clothes on, right? It doesn't make any sense to take the clothes off. That's just that's extra, right? But the clothes are there. She's thinking, well, maybe somebody stole the body. Jesus appears, the resurrected Jesus, has a conversation with her, says, go tell the disciples that I'm risen, and I'm going to come and, and, and talk to them and see them and visit with them. So she runs back, knocks on the door. The disciples finally let her in. She says, I just saw Jesus. He's raised from the dead. Do you, you think they believe it? They don't. They go, I don't believe you. You must have been hallucinating. You've kind of, you know, you're just filled with grief, Mary. You don't know what you're talking about. So they go down. They see that the body's gone as well. And then Jesus appears to them. Like it's like they have eyewitness accounts. All of a sudden, Jesus starts to, he meets with the disciples. He meets with other people. For 40 days, he's there in Jerusalem meeting with people. And that's part of why that's the explanation why they could go from cowering in their house, locked away, afraid, to a day later they're bold and encouraged, or just a few days later. It says, when, the, when we apostles told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
We didn't base our message on clever myths that we made up. Rather, we witnessed his majesty with our own eyes. There's something powerful when you see it with your own eyes. If you, were to, if you went to a funeral, you saw the person buried. Many of you have been at funerals. You know, you went to the wake. Maybe it's a loved one. You, you went to the grave site. They, they were buried. You saw them buried. If you saw them three days later, would that change? Would that like freak you out a little bit? Like, you'd be confused. You'd be like, what's up with this? I mean, this is, it might change your perspective, right? I mean, and this is what happened. I mean, it radically changed him. And then he says, and for 40 days, he went around meeting many people. It says for 40 days after his death, Jesus appeared to people many times in many ways that proved beyond doubt that he was alive. They saw him and he talked with them about the kingdom of God. It says Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day. He was seen by Peter and then by the 12 apostles. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time. That's just, he's just like teaching and 500 of them. This is, he's not even saying the whole thing. He's just telling you some of it. Most of whom are still alive, though some have died by now. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, I saw him too. This is Paul writing. He's saying, I saw him, you know, as well. This is conclusive proof. It's like definitive evidence. When you see somebody, if, if I were to tell you, yeah, I just uh, had uh, Starbucks coffee. I saw the Queen of England up here at this Starbucks right up the street. You'd go, come on, right? You wouldn't believe me. But what if you heard from 900 people? People saying, yeah, no, she was at Starbucks. Somebody else says, yeah, she's staying at the Quality Inn. And somebody else, you know, yeah, I had her over for dinner. We had some lamb and we had some, you know, some crumpets. I don't know what, she, what they eat, right? But, you know, and, and somebody else, yeah, we were there at a big symposium and she was there. And I mean, 900 people, you'd say, well, I think the Queen of England was here. And this is what's happening. Eyewitnesses, they saw Jesus for themselves. That's why it moved from 12 to 120, and then 5,000, and then 30,000 in Jerusalem, and then a half a million in Jerusalem alone became Christ followers. And then it started to go throughout the whole Roman Empire, even against persecution. They said, hey, we're going to persecute you. They started getting threatened by, by Christians. And 300 years later, the whole, nearly the whole Roman Empire becomes Christian because of this this transformation that happened that he's describing right here so we don't have to be afraid to die we know we we're, we're forgiven and then three is is we have God's spirit within us so Jesus for 40 days he goes the risen Christ talking to people teaching him interacting with him and then he ascends to heaven and he says, wait here because I am going to give you the Holy Spirit. That happens on the day of Pentecost, which is 10 days after Jesus ascends to heaven. And he goes, don't do anything. Wait for me. He's saying, until you have the power, you don't even want to try to do life even one more week. He says, just wait for me because you need power. That's a message for, for you. If you're operating outside of God's power. He goes, you need more than your own effort, your own willpower. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, notice he says, you will receive power. He's talking about God's power. And will tell people everywhere about me, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. He's saying, all around, all around. You see, the Holy Spirit is a promise from Jesus. He says, it's for every believer, for every believer, that you can live life with God's power. You don't have to do it on your own. In fact, you need that supernatural advantage. God offers it to you. You can tap into that, that additional power that, that you can't do. In fact, that's God's plan for your life. You can't really fulfill your purpose unless you have the power. You know, a, a vacuum cleaner can't fulfill its purpose if it's not plugged in. A blender can't fulfill its purpose if it's not plugged in. You have a purpose that you can only fulfill when you get plugged in to God's power. What kind of power is that? 
Well, the power, he's saying, is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. You go, Andy, come on. Look at it. It says, I pray that you will begin to understand how incredibly great is God's power. Incredibly great is God's power to what? To help you. To help those who believe him. It is that same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. That's what he offers you. You see, the power that raised Jesus from the dead can also raise a marriage from the dead. The power that raised a body out of that tomb can also raise a dead career that looks like it's over. The power that God offers is the power that can free you from the painful memories of the past. The power that God offers you gives you the power to start over when you need that power, when you feel like your dream has collapsed and the things that you've been pursuing all your life has come to an end. God says, that's the power that I want you to have. That's the message of Easter. It's incredible. God says, I'm going to give you the power to overcome things you've not been able to overcome before, the habits and the things that, that, that you just keep getting stuck in. Because that's what he offers. And then number four is we know that we have purpose that you were created for. That's another reason we have more hope. Because God has a purpose for you. You see, no matter what you've accomplished in life, because you can have success without having significance. And when we have an emptiness in our lives, because we don't know our purpose, and if you don't know your purpose, which a lot of people don't, then there is an emptiness. And we, there's a lot of things you can try to fill that emptiness with. You can fill it with, with money, with, with sex, with drugs, with internet, just binging on the TV or the internet, surfing around, shopping, careers, kids, all kinds of stuff. It's not all negative. I'm just saying you have an emptiness and you're going to try to fill that instead of being fulfilled in what God has for you, your purpose. Instead of just trying to fill it up, God says, I have a purpose for you. We want to help you to discover your purpose. If you're even fuzzy at all on that, we want you to be crystal clear, which is why we do Growth Track. If you're new with us, you heard about that earlier, right after this service, as you leave, we just ask for, give us one hour of your time for one month after each service. All we want is, and we will help you discover your purpose. That's a big part of the reason we exist as a church. Our vision of our church is to help people to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. We want you to know why you are here. That's a fundamental question. No matter how much you have succeeded in life, no matter what you've accomplished, if you don't know those fun, that foundational question of why am I here? Why did God create me? What am I supposed to do with my life? Then you will never find fulfillment. You'll never know your purpose. And you'll just be a wandering generality instead of a meaningful specific accomplishing what God has for you. Now, there's a lot of Bible verses because it's filled throughout the Bible about how God wants you to know your purpose. Here's a few of them. It says, The Lord will fulfill His purpose for me because His love endures forever. What does that mean? It means that because God loves you, He wants you to live a purpose. He's given you a purpose. He wants you to find that so you can live the fulfilled life that He has for you. You were made by God, you were made for God. And understanding that and living that makes all the difference in the world. You know, one, the greatest conversion probably in the entire Bible is, is this guy named Paul. Paul was, uh, becomes St. Paul, but he was a religious terrorist. He was killing Christians all around Palestine. And on one of his trips, he was going to go to Syria, to Damascus, to kill some more Christians. And on his way, he gets confronted by the risen Jesus. Jesus says, hey, why are you persecuting me? And he goes, my Lord, my God. He, he just does a 180. And he becomes known as the apostle of love. He wrote some amazing things about love. One is in 1 Corinthians 13, read in weddings every day all over the globe turned from a religious terrorist to the apostle of love. That's a, that's, he understood his purpose. See, before he didn't understand his purpose, he was way off base. But he goes, oh no, I was actually created and made 
for God because God loves me. The Bible says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. God's plan for you is that you, you would have a, perp, a hope and a purpose and a future, and it's a good thing. Jesus said, my purpose is to give life in all of its fullness. Until you're connected with God, you're not really living. You can exist and just work, pay bills, live for the weekends, try to hit up a, a cool party from time to time. And again, just, just moving through life, not really clear that God has given you a purpose. You were made for more than that. You were made for more than that. Don't fritter away your life. It's too important. God has a purpose for you. He says, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. So even the tough things, even the difficulties, sometimes we actually let that get in the way of our relationship with God. Like, well, how can I serve God? How can I love a God who allows evil in the world, makes life so difficult? Well, life is tough. And there are a number of reasons why life is difficult. We live in a fallen world. There, we have our own sin issues we work with. Other people sin against us. The devil's out and about doing his thing. But God says, regardless of what happens in your life, he will still work those things in advance. Nothing can thwart God's purpose in your life. He will still use even bad things, even people that try to harm you, try to get you off your purpose. He goes, that's not going to work. He goes, I'm going to make sure. He goes, I'm going to work all things to, for good for those who have been called according to my purpose. Paul says, you know what? When it's all said and done, I'm going to stay focused. He goes, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. That's the kind of attitude we need to have. You know, that nothing's going to keep me from serving God, from loving God, from receiving the forgiveness he promises. Nothing's going to keep me from having the hope in my heart that even after death, there is life for me. And I'm going to live with that in mind, regardless of what goes on around us, right? I mean, as far as we know, there could be a new variant, and this all starts all over again, the pandemic. I know most of us want it over, right? But that's, you know, it's going to be a hassle if that happens. But it shouldn't affect your attitude towards, hey, what if I die? We're going to be socially responsible. We don't want to cause problems. But we don't have fear about death. That is part of the evidence that we have of God working in our life, that we know I have a purpose. And God's going to accomplish the purpose he has for me, nothing will thwart that. Nothing. God's forgiven me. I, I don't have to fear death. God's spirit is inside me, empowering me. And I've got a purpose. I was made for a purpose. You know, probably everybody here made a decision to come to church or if you're online to join us. I'm going to visit online. I'm going to go to Vineyard. But God is bigger than our own decision-making. See, God wanted you to hear a message of hope this Easter, that he loves you, that he cares about you, that he knows all the things that you've gone through. He knows your private thoughts, your private struggles, what you're going through, what you're worrying about. And he goes, I have a message of hope for you. I want you to step into that. I want you to receive that. You don't have to have the same old same old that you came in with. You can turn everything around today. How do you do that? Well, it really comes from entering into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Saying, God, I want, I want what you have. I want what I want to receive that forgiveness that you died on the cross for. I want to receive that spirit and the hope in my life that you rose from the dead for. And here's how you do that. It's it's actually just through prayer. Now, I'm going to lead you. I'm going to invite you to pray with me. Here's what the Bible says. This is the kind of prayer he talks about. He talks, this is, he's talking about prayer here. He says, if you confess your mouth with your mouth, you say, you actually say something, but not just that you say it, but you believe in your heart. So the words by itself don't mean anything. It's when you put your faith to it. Even just a small amount. Jesus says the smallest amount of faith is all that's needed. He says, what do you confess? That Jesus is boss. He's Lord. He calls the shots. You can't have your plan and God's plan. That's part of the problem that you're experiencing. 
I certainly have that problem. Whenever I try to do my plan, it never works out. You have to, just, you have to say, I'm going to give up my plan and do God's plan, His purpose for me, which is, as He said, is good, has a hope, has a future to it. That's why you were created. You were created by God for God. And so you just confess that. You say, God, I want you to be my Lord. And, I, and believe it in your heart that God raised him from the dead. He goes, that, and th you'll be saved. You enter into a relationship with God that way. This Easter, make, do that. I, I want to encourage you. Pray. I'm going to pray with you right now. Now, this is going to be a different kind of prayer. If you've prayed ever, most probably everybody here has prayed at least a little bit. Generally, we close our eyes, right? But you know, the Bible says you don't have, in fact, a lot of times we're in strict, we see Jesus actually keeping his eyes open while he prayed. You can open your eyes. And so instead of bowing your head, I'm going to ask you to keep your heads up. I'm going to ask you to pray with me and keep your eyes open, wide open. And we'll read this prayer together. And if it means something, if you pray it from your heart, God says that is the magic sauce. That's what transforms everything. Otherwise, it's just words. But I'm going to invite you to pray with me right now. Let's pray this prayer together. Dear God, would you say, say it out loud to get, together with me? Dear God, today I accept all that Jesus did for me on the cross. Thank you for forgiving everything I've done wrong. Thank you that I don't have to fear death. Please put your spirit of love and power in me. Thank you that you never will stop loving me. I want to live for the purpose that you created for me. I trust you to take me to heaven when I die. Amen. Amen. Now listen, for those of you who prayed and you'd believe that, that is a game changer, okay? Would, let's just congratulate those who prayed that for their first time. I'm proud of you. You know, that's, God does some amazing things. It starts with just one step of faith like that. And then God starts to open up a world that changes everything. I want to encourage you, take your next step. There's always another step, another part of your journey. I have another step. Everybody does. You have a next step. Let me tell you how to do that. If you would, take out your program right now. If everyone would do that, take out your program. In there is that card that we put in, the response card. Daniel will talk to you about it. We're going to be doing a message series uh, in September. That's a little ways away. But I'm going to ask you, let me know what you want us to preach on, what you want to hear on. You may, may, it might not be in there. I just put some ideas in there to get, your, to get it started. And you can write in there, you know, something you've always wanted to hear what the Bible has to say on. And if we get enough of them, we're going to clump them together. We will speak on that. On the back of your response card, if you would turn it on the back, you'll see some next steps. Next up, some of you prayed with me and you, you, you put your faith in Christ today. Let me know about that. That's the first one. Begin a relationship with God. Just check that box. And we're going to collect all of those in just a moment. I, would, I want to be able to pray for you. And we're going, to, uh, we're going to help you to know what your next step is. Also, if, if you've never been water baptized, one's coming up May 1st and 2nd. And uh, we'd love to share with you what the Bible talks about. Jesus encouraged all of his followers to get baptized. If you'd like to know more about the vineyard, a lot of that happens in Growth Track. Again, step one, right after the service, I'd love to see you in there. Sharon and I will be in there to greet you. Step right in, learn more about the vineyard, and learn, most importantly, about why God made you. Discover your purpose, okay? And then next week, super exciting, we're going to start a new series on rethinking your life. You know, when we go through all the kinds of stuff we've been going through this last year, sometimes it's just, it's a good time to just rethink, hey, you know, I want to get, make sure I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing in my life. So we're going to talk, we're going to dig right into that, rethinking your life, looking at things maybe differently than you have in the past and for the better. Watch this video that kind of talks about our series that begins next weekend. 200 people.